go. All right. So um, today, the whole point of today is to the whole. Okay. It's, a, it's such a happy noise. And we're geniuses for using that, that noise. It's not like Beethoven's good. Oh, 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 oh. No. That makes you happy. <laughs> this just makes you want to go out and kill someone. So, I know, right? Right? Exactly. Um, the whole point of today is to address a concern I have with every statistics textbook I've ever seen, including your open source one. And the only concern I have is they very often will say things in the first, say, 100 pages. Well, they'll, they'll hit you with a buckshot of all kinds of stuff. They'll hit you with data types. They'll hit you with chart types. They'll hit you with, with uh, data classifications. They'll hit you with terminology. And in like 80% of those graph types, chart types, terminologies, they'll say, OK, when we now get to relative position, you'll need to know what an ogive is. When we get to uh, percentile ranking, you'll want to know what a cumulative frequency polygon is. When we get to the standard normal distribution, you're going to want to know what a z-score is. But they're teaching you in that first couple hundred pages, first hundred pages, what a z-score is, what an ogive is, what a cumulative relative frequency polygon is. But saying, now remember this, because we're going to do it later. Well, later is like eight weeks from now. You will not remember that. You just won't. I mean, it, it's not fair to assume that you would. You've got other stuff on your mind, like your lives and things like that. So what I try to do in this first day is basically whittle down the stuff in that first bit of your text that you actually have to know right now, because we're going to start using it right away. And that's what today is all about, is kind of that a few terms, a few terms, a few graphical ideas that we're actually going to use starting today and going into, going into Tuesday. And then the other stuff will pick up as we need it. And you'll, you'll, you'll see this in your homework sheets. When you do your homework for relative position, you'll be like, why is he sending me back to page 20? Because in page 20, that's where they actually talk about an ogive. And you now have to understand what an ogive is to know why my baby is not underweight, even though the doctor tells me that he or she is. So that's the kind of that's the kind of bouncing around you have to do because I haven't gotten a chance to rewrite the textbook yet. We're working on it. We're working on it. Got to check with Susan and Barbara first. And I'll piss them off. So anyway, the big first term that we're going to deal with is just data because that's all we've got in this class. There are so many uncertainties in this class. Hence the name of the first word of the course, which is what. The first name of the course is, well, I guess it's intro. intro. <laughs> Third word of the course, intro to probability. Probability. First bit of that word, probable. Not certain, probable, right? I mean, you've got, you've got uncertainty built into it. So all you've got is your data, and your data is trying to give you a vision or a, a, a sneak peek or a, or a small view into a larger whole. So data is everything. Everything is data, and we need to learn how to classify that today and actually kind of deal with it. And dealing with it is the rest of the course. As far as classification, I kind of break it into to two types. You guys actually dealt with this. Remember when uh, we did the ASCOCC survey last time? Believe it or not, you, you were dealing with qualitative data, qualitative attribute data. Believe it or not, although it didn't seem like it at the time because you were writing numbers down. But this is non-numerical data, non-numerical data. For example. How are you getting to school? COCC might want to know this. How do you get to school? Why might they want to know this? Parking. Maybe to figure out. I've heard estimates that a parking space at COCC to make a new one costs anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000. Wow. I don't know why, A, it's that expensive, and B, it's that wide of a range. I don't know if it's, if it's harder to make parking spaces in different parts of campus. Maybe there's the grading issues. But I've heard that new parking, the most recent estimate is $2,000 a space. Uh, I've also heard 5,000 bucks a space. When I put forth, maybe you should build a parking garage over by uh, Pioneer, they said, well, that'll be even more expensive. I, again, I don't, I don't know why. But I do know that they, well, labor, just because it's harder to go up in the air. Okay, good, Robert, thank you, thank you. That doesn't explain to me why a graded piece of ground is fine, Fred, but again, I know nothing about it, so I'm going to tell you ignorance on that one. But regardless, COCC would want to know your method of transportation, because you don't want to spend two grand at least on a parking space to build something that isn't, isn't needed. Although, I don't think anybody in this class is going to argue any more parking spaces. Right? So, that's qualitative data. That's qualitative data. What method of payment are you going to use when you, uh, when you check out on your online order or in a store? That's qualitative. Why? When somebody asks you how you're going to pay, do you say three? <laughs> Not that they give you a list where it's numbered. You know, one MasterCard, two Visa, three Discover. But still, whether it's numbered or not, it's still not a numbered data. The data is MasterCard. I want to use my MasterCard. 
the number on the MasterCard is definitely numerical, but the MasterCard itself is qualitative, or attribute, sometimes it's called, what color your hair is, what types of uh, vegetation we have on campus, all the different trees we have in our Arboretum tour. You know COCC has an Arboretum tour? They've got hundreds of trees around campus that are not native to the area that they've, they've planted and taken care of. There's apple trees down by Boyle with beautiful apples on them right now. Go pick some. They look delicious. Right? Red apples? Get them before they freeze. So anyway, qualitative. There's not much we can do with qualitative data, unfortunately. We'll talk more about that uh, uh, starting on, on Tuesday. But for right now, just realize that qualitative just means there's no number attached to it. Or at least the data itself isn't, isn't implied with numbers. This is the stuff that's more fun to deal with mathematically, is the quantitative type of data. So once we've established that there are people that are driving to COCC, how many? How many of them are there? So now we're starting to count the drivers. And then we might have to figure out, okay, we got fixed, we got to fix the area that we can pave. We've got to make sure how wide to make these, these, these spaces so that we can get enough people in but still be safe. Because obviously, the skinnier, you make the, uh, the skinnier you make the spaces, the more cars you can fit in. And the more you're going to raise the tempers of those getting out of the cars when they're constantly smashing their neighbor's cars with the doors as they're getting out. <laughs> so what's interesting about that is that actually hits both of these. I mentioned, I mentioned the number of people driving to school. That's one type of quantitative data. And then I measured the width, the width of a parking space on average we're going to have to make. And you guys probably noticed that when you park in different places, there are different widths. Mm -hmm. Not just on campus, but anywhere for that matter. Maybe you pull into a space that's way too narrow. Maybe your car is just way too big, but nonetheless, same car in different spaces might get parked easier. When you count data, we just call that discrete. That's just the name that it gets. It's called discrete. And when you measure it, we call it continuous. That's just the terms we've been handed down. I think they actually got handed down from a, a older mathematics class. Statistics is a pretty young math class, only 100 or so years of, of serious study uh, academically and maybe 200 total years of study compared to something like algebra that's been around for thousands of years. So discrete and continuous actually come down from much, much older class, or, uh, much, much older uh, subject matter. So I mentioned the number of cars coming onto campus and how wide we should make the spots. What's the number of cars coming onto campus? Which, uh, which kind? Be brave, go ahead. Go ahead, Max. Yeah, it's discrete, because you count them. There's one, there's another one, there's another one. You count them as they come in, right? You don't measure, you just count them. How about the width of the uh, spaces? It's definitely continuous, because you measure that. And some students have a, tr it's tricky at first, deciding when, whether one is one or the other. The easiest way I remember is you count discrete. And as far as what to measure, I've thought about this for almost 20 years, and I can only think of four things that you measure. Only four things. One, you already mentioned, the width of a, a parking lot, that's length. That's one thing that is measured as length. What's something else that you measure? Time. Time is something else that you measure. Beautiful. Volume. Say that again. Volume. I, I love that. Who told me your name too? Hattie. Hattie, and who told me time? Scott. Scott, thank you, Scott. And Hattie, yes, I break volume down as, a, as an extension of length, because it's length times length times length. So you can call, you're right, it is continuous, but, but I, I don't count that as a separate thing, I just call it its own thing. So we got length, we got time. Temperature. Temperature for sure, for sure is, is measured. And there's one more. Why would you care about this? I mentioned it earlier. You might care about it when you're watching your, your, your newborn grow. Weight. Weight, definitely. Those four. Everything else, and Hattie, not that volume is not continuous because it sure is, but it's kind of like a subdivision of the other one. A student in my last class was like, how about, how about speed? Speed's a great one, but speed is distance over time. And both of those are continuous, so therefore it falls under. So those four things, if you are measuring any one of those four things, you are dealing with continuous data. And I can't think of any fifth. I've thought about it for years. I can't think of a fifth. So basically, if you count it, it's here. If it's length, weight, temperature, or time, you're there. And that's it. Here's our two classes. Make sense? Cool. So this is the one you see an awful lot in the news, awful lot. Uh, I mentioned, I think I half jokingly told you that Congress is less popular than syphilis last time. That was done by a Gallup poll. They asked a thousand Americans, you didn't hear about that? No. Yeah, it, it was, came out, Congress's approval rating is about 9%, eight or 9%. Syphilis infection rate is somewhere around 10. So Congress is less popular than syphilis. 
Uh, the reason they get that number is they ask a thousand people, for example, you know, do you approve or disapprove of Congress? If 90 of those 1,000 say, yes, we approve, that's a 9% approval rate. That's discrete data because you get a thousand people and you count the ones that say yes. Count the ones that say yes. Most of the polls, Obama's approval rating, Senate approval rating, the rate of autism, the rate, anytime you hear the word rate, it's definitely a discrete data set because you're counting something. And that's, I would say, most of what you read about. Most of what you read about in the news is that kind of a study because it's very easy to do that kind of a study. Assuming you get a good sample, more on that in about five minutes, counting is simple. Measurement is hard. Measurement is difficult. Measurement is very, very difficult. If you're talking about average newborn weights, you have to have a machine that can precisely measure that. Temperature, precisely measure. Length, precisely measure. Time, precisely measure. And that precision costs money, and it takes time and effort. So you'll, you'll notice that you'll see very, very uh, uh, exponentially more studies based on discrete than continuous data, at least in, in, common, in common media outlets. In scientific journals, it's a totally different story because scientific journals generally have uh, people that are contributing that have budgets that are usually paid for by the generous donations of taxpayers. But nonetheless, the machinery costs money and the, and the labor costs money. So, make sense, please. Well, that's kind of what I was, in my mind I was thinking. So, like, say autism or Down syndrome or whatever, things that are, are scientific or medical, it, are the more reliable or are they just, are they taken from like, like real, like health department, this is how many people have this, or is it taken from like just counting a thousand people? This is That's fantastic. It. What you need to tell me, maybe can do. Jamie. Jamie, thank you. What you want to do, let's just grab a Gallup poll real quick. Gallup, Obama, approval. Okay. So just grab it in a Gallup poll. Okay. This is definitely a discrete, a discrete uh, 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 study. And you're going to see it. There we go. Here's the graph of. Obama's approval rating from February 09 all the way up to basically now. And you'll notice back here, it was somewhere around 62% approval and the rest disapproval, I guess. And then it, it kind of operates like this as it goes up and back up and back. What you want to do when you see a poll like this is question it from the moment you see it. And you want to scroll until you get to the fine print. And you say, oh look, the daily results are based on telephone interviews with approximately 1,500 national adults. Now, don't concern yourself with that number. That number is plenty. Believe it or not, that number is plenty. And that, that takes statistic students a while to kind of process that how can 1,500 people be enough to stand for an entire population of, say, 150 million voting Americans? It's more than enough, actually. But what you want to know is how did they get those 1,500 people? That's the question. There's different kinds of sampling you can do. And 244 and your research methods classes get into this ad nauseum. But it's not so much the result that I question, it's how the numbers that created the result were gotten. Statistics is a foregone conclusion, believe it or not. Getting the data is 99% of the effort. And that's why we have entire classes devoted to just that. I almost wish you would take those classes before you take this class, but that isn't how it's set up. So that's my question is go in there and find out. This isn't enough for me. Telephone interviews, was it random digit dialing? Is it contiguous United States? Is it all 50 states? You know, did we include cell phones or not cell phones in here? Is everybody accounted for? I want to know all the answers to all these questions plus ones I'm not thinking of. Is that kind of an answer? Yeah, it, and that's, that's, everything is suspect. And you'll see, I, I'll bring examples like this in. And I say suspect not, not in a negative way, but in a critical way. I mean, prove to me that data is valid. And Gallup does a pretty good job, honestly. Gallup, Quinnipiac, Rasmussen, these are good polling agents. So, uh, Quinnipiac is a little school in Pennsylvania. Quinnipiac, yeah, Quinnipiac University. They have an entire polling center uh, right there, the Polling Institute. Oh, it's in Connecticut, not, not Pennsylvania. These guys are phenomenal, uh, phenomenal data collectors. So if you ever need to, to back, and, and they tend to be fairly, fairly regional. They tend to stick to mostly northeastern uh, um, um, regions. But nonetheless, uh, New York City likely voter poll like, they don't come out and say, we, question, we, we asked the entire country, because they didn't. They asked New York City. And that's okay as long as that doesn't try to get spread too far. Like, we did a New York City poll, but we, we are convinced that 8 in 10 Tibetans think that, well, that's great. Did you ask Tibetans? We asked New York City. Could it be I wouldn't do that? But pe people do things that are just as ridiculous. For example, 
they'll put an email poll out. They'll send a mass email poll out. How's Obama doing? And then they report the results on that as if they were scientific fact. Okay, so who has access to that poll? You have to get an email to you or download it from Facebook, even better. And they're pretending as if it's a scientific result. No, it's not. Number one, the, co the collection was based on the respondents, not the collector. Gallup is making the calls out to 1,500 people. That is expecting you to care enough to respond. There's a big difference there, right? Who's going to respond? Historically, people that are upset, generally. People that are totally stoked are like, yeah, they just kind of go and keep being happy. But people that are upset are like, no, you suck. And, that, and this, is, this is one of the critiques that I've heard from student evaluations going online was that people are worried that because they're online now and you're not forced to do them, that we're going to hear from the students' negative responses more. Well, guess what? Nobody forced you to do them back in the day either. Just because you were sitting in class, we left the room. You couldn't leave without doing one. So anyway, please, Hattie, go ahead. Couldn't the thing be said, though, about the Gallup polls? Because who's hanging out by their phone at, like, 3 in the afternoon to answer a poll? The question is, it doesn't matter. Can you give me five minutes to elucidate on that? Sure. There's a very special six-letter six word that, that deals with that. And if you give me... I'm thinking five minutes. We'll get into it. Great. This is a great question. Did you hear what Hattie's question was? Mm -hmm. The question is, who's hanging out by their phone to get called? We got a solution for that. Oh, Promise you. Hold me. You be careful. Of course. I had a great beer for my 40th birthday. Watch it back there. All right. Okay. <laughs> now, we'll get to that. I promise you, Hattie. We'll get to inferential statistics. I promise you. 243, I like, to, I like to give you the two branches of statistics because I like that COCC and the University System of Oregon has 243 and 244 because predominantly 243 is descriptive and 244 is inferential. More on that in five minutes or four and a half minutes or so. Descriptive statistics is simply getting a bunch of data and then reporting on it in some way. And that's the end of the story. Collecting data, putting it back out there in some way, and game over. So, and remember guys, you're gonna have these PowerPoints linked up on the schedule page by the end of the day, so write down as much or as little as you have to. If you wanna let this kind of wash over you right now, that's fine. Um, do what you, whatever you have to do. I'm not gonna tell you how to take notes, but don't feel the need, you're gonna have all this. Does this map look familiar? Ish? Ish, right? 2012, we had a presidential election that you remember. It was a little bit, it made, it made a huge deal of the news. <laughs> Sometimes for no, no apparent reason. But you had Obama versus Romney. And if you remember the results, we have this electoral college thing, which is very, very interesting. And the popular vote was almost split, even split very, very evenly, 50.6 to 47.8 percent. Which, if you add them up, adds to what is that 98.4 percent. So there's a 1.6 percent missing, and I think that could be explained by looking at northeastern Oregon. Why is there 1.6 percent missing? Yeah, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth parties. There's a whole bunch. Tell me your name. Michael. Michael, thank you. We've got these other parties. I, I'm pretty sure every Ron Paul supporter in America lives in Northeast <laughs> Oregon. It was amazing driving out there, seeing the sides of barns with Ron Paul's face, 20 by 30. Amazing, amazing. They all live out there, Pendleton. So anyway, um, that's where the other 1.6 is. It's not a two-party system, although you, you swear it was by looking at results like this. And I don't think since Ross Perot right against Clinton back in 92, have we even seen a third party candidate pull anything? I think he pulled something like almost 20% of the popular vote back then, which was amazing. You know, he was actually a contender. I mean, but we haven't seen that since. But anyway, what you're seeing here is not the popular vote layout, but the electoral vote layout. This is what, this is what the big deal is made about on election night. I don't, I still don't understand the whole electoral college system. And don't try to explain it because People have tried to explain to me I'm an idiot. I can't get it. I'm not sure it should be gotten, but whatever. This is the result of the Electoral College. You look at that map, and it does not look like Obama won the White House no. by electoral votes. That looks more red than blue. The whole middle of the country, the entire south with the exception of Florida, this corridor from Arizona up to, uh, up to Idaho, it looks ridiculously red. And how could Obama have possibly won the White House? Because the populations are underrepresented on that map. You've got high, where are the densest populations? California. California. Right, near, near major urban centers, generally on coasts. Generally on coasts. The two largest cities in America, New York City, LA. So what some clever folks did was they made a map that was distorted, that was distorted in such a way that populations 
were represented more effectively. Yeah, isn't that cool, Scott? That's kind of slick, because now you can see, oh, God. So back up, back up one. Find Wyoming. Okay, one of those rectangle states. Very windy there, very pretty there, too. Find Delaware, quiz. Find Delaware, it's connected to Maryland. Yes, it's right there. The diamond state, that's where I'm from. Now, Delaware size compared to Wyoming size, right? Find Delaware and Wyoming now. Ooh. There's Delaware. And where's Wyoming? Right there. Almost the same size. Except in Delaware, we're all on top of each other. In Wyoming, we're all on top of grass. So, so there you go. You're seeing much better representation of population. All of a sudden, you can see the blue versus the red. You're like, oh, there's a lot more blue there. A lot more blue. The, the lighter populated states have shrunk down. California is, is predictably large. Yeah? People did even better. Here's the county maps of the election. These are the county maps. It, um, I should have asked you guys. Are there light switches in here? Yes. Let me see. Let me check the light. Is that better? Yeah. Is that too dark? No. That's an experiment. Oh, that doesn't help. That turns off half of these two. Look at that. <laughs> that turns off the other half. Very interesting. Okay, so we'll do that, yes? Yeah? Oh, God. I think we'll do that. Decent? Okay. We'll turn them on and off as we need them. Uh, okay, so this is even worse, red versus blue wise, because red versus blue wise, this looks even less blue than red by county until you adjust the counties for population. Find LA on this map. And while you're at it, find New York City. Okay, if you can't, find LA on this map. A little bit easier. Find New York City on this map. Hint, it's the big blue thing in the top right, right? So, again, it's, it's hard to look at it, a little nausea-inducing, but nonetheless, you can see where the populations are, right? You see where the populations are. If you get even more crazy, here is the non-scale map by what percent of each county voted which way. So the more purple, the more split it was. Red versus blue makes purple. So if you see purple, heavily purple areas were split half and half. It's almost impossible to tell what the hell happened here. And this is one where I don't think you can get anything from this. <laughs> I mean, you got New York, you got LA, but I mean, it's so hard to look at. Although it's more blue than red, right? It is more blue than red. So you get that same overriding, okay, I get it. it Obama won by electoral votes. But I think it does get ridiculous to a point. But I didn't come here to tell you that. I came here to tell you that each one of these maps, no matter how silly they are or how crazy they get, are simply taking data from the result of the election and then getting put out for our consumption. That's it. Nothing to read into. Obama won 50.6% of the popular and 47.8 of the, of the uh, or excuse me, and, and Romney won 47.8. Obama got 61.7 of the electoral. Romney got the rest. That's it. End of story. No questions asked. Cool. That's descriptive statistics. The story ends with the presentation. What's the other one? I lied to you, Hattie. It took more than five minutes. Inferential statistics. Inferential statistics is the one that we read about and causes all the discussions around the dinner table. The only kind of discussion that you can have about descriptive statistics is did you trust your source? Did you trust your source when I told you that 60.7% of the electoral votes went to Obama? You should, because it's in every possible news outlet, because they all use the same wire. But inferential stat, the true unknown happens here. And the true decisions are made from here. Hattie asked a phenomenal question when I turned, I turned the tables around and I said, listen, why? You, gotta, you can't trust those Facebook type polls. It's because the only people you're hearing from are the ones that care enough to respond. Her question, very, very good one was, well, who's sitting around with their phone waiting for, waiting for a call? Here's the answer. This study is entitled, well, the article is entitled, Study Claims. Kathy, just so you know, anytime you hear the word study claims or studies show, it's inferential statistics. Some study was done, and the part that makes it inferential is they're taking the results of that study and applying it to an entire population. Let's talk about each of those terms, okay? Let's talk about each of those terms. Inferential. Key word or key, key prefix in that word? Inference. Even smaller, infer, right? We're inferring something about a result. So you start with a descriptive statistic. 
but then you take it further by assuming that, that statistic holds in the general population. This is what Matthew 44 is all about. However, not every one of you is taking Matthew 44. So I'm going to hit you with enough of it in 243 so that if you don't take Matthew 44, at least you can go read the news more carefully. More on that to come. So anyway, we take a, that's that word I was talking about, Hattie, a random sample from a population. We mentioned the word random on Tuesday. We mentioned the word random on Tuesday. Think back to Tuesday, talk about random. What do you remember about randomness? Good. Come here. Thank you, Kate. It's going to cluster. Randomness is going to cluster. Good. Kate's definition, or Kate's explanation of randomness, perfect. I did not define it. I just said inferential statistics takes a random sample. What does the word random actually mean? It does cluster by behavior, but what does it mean to be truly random? Or for a sample from a population to be truly random? What does it mean? We use the word random a lot, don't we? But what does it mean to you? What do you go ahead, tell me again. Jenny, thank it you. Be a double blind. That, that, that's an example of a random study. Very, very good. But how do you randomize it? This is good. She mentioned double blind studies. That means, suppose, for example, you're testing a drug. FDA is testing a new drug for headaches. They make a bunch of pills that have the drug in them, and they make a bunch of pills that have no drug in them. And then they give these pills to a researcher. If that researcher just gets a pill in their hand and doesn't know what pill they got, that's single blind. And then they take it in and give it to the person in the study. They don't know what pill they got, double blind. The only person who knows what drug is getting is the person behind the street handing it to the first person. Good, but here's the question is, how do I make sure that study itself is randomized? I guess that's what I'm getting at. Very, very good, Jenny. That's an example of a, of, a, of a randomized study. Go ahead, be brave, my friends. Other, other, other uses of the word random. We use this a lot, oh my God, that's so random. Oh my God, that's so random. Actually, when, when we say that often, oh my God, you have the same birthday, that's so random. Actually, it's just clustering. <laughs> but, but it is. It's just coincidence. Random coincidence. Please, Kate, go. Um, I was going to say random is where you don't know where it's going to land. So in this case, Perf. you don't know who's going to answer on the other end of the phone. I'm going to randomly select a student from this class right now. Tell me again. Scott, randomly selected. I'm going to randomly select another one. Again. How do you feel about my random selections? Mm. Well, how do you know it's not random? It's your start. <laughs> how do you know? Because I'm a math genius. <laughs> I don't have a little randomizer in my head right now that it already assigned you each a random number, and it just so happened that Scouters was 23, and it picked 23, and Jenny's was 18, and then it picked 18. How do you know that? Because chances are it didn't. Because chances are every one of you has a 1 in, what, 30% chance of being picked, which is roughly 3%. So if I go, I'm going to pick a random person, Natalie, boom, done. I happen to look over at Natalie and thought in two hours we'd run with Vickers on the field with Natalie. That's hardly random. As Kate said, everybody has to have the same chance of being selected. And that's why you don't have to be sitting waiting by your phone. Because if we call and you don't pick the phone up, we randomize somebody else and call them. And we call until we get 1,500. And I don't care if you're sitting by your phone or not. If you're not by the phone, I don't get you. That's okay. That's okay. There is somebody else like you that I will get, though, Hattie. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It implies nothing about not liking me. It's just that if you're not by your phone, I will get somebody else in the population randomly, and my study is valid that way. Cool. Fair enough? Thank you, Frank. Great question earlier. I wanted to make sure I got it, got it answered. Patrick? Well, your comment was someone else like her. A random member of the population. When I say like her, she's a member of the population. I will get another random member of the population. But I'm standing very close to this camera right now. It doesn't look at what she suggested earlier, because how do we know that the population is like her? At that age group, for example. I don't know. Well, it's a, that age group may be in school, where a 75-year-old may be sitting at home waiting by their phone. Fantastic. Who are you? Who are you interested in studying? Random. This no. Hang on now. This is a this is a loaded question. Who are you interested in surveying? Can I answer that question via this example? Because I might not necessarily want to get a random American. I might want to get a random voting American. I might want to get a random American over the age of 45 but before retirement. There's all kinds of demographical information that then the survey would have to weed through. And this is a problem with survey methods. I've helped so many people get their PhDs and they come to me and they say, this was such a great idea three years ago and now I've got seven data points. Because what happens is they start with say 100 and one by one people fall out of the study and they're left with the seven that they've got. And it's unfortunate, but because of it, depending on how selective your sample is, you might have to, or selective your population is, you may have to deal with a very, very small sample because of it. Mm -hmm. So I think your question can be addressed with this example. 
Study claims caffeine addicts get no jolt from morning coffee. Okay, your job, read that a little bit. Hopefully you get rid of it. If you have to come a little bit closer, that's fine too. Tell me who you think the population is and tell me what the random sample is. Or the sample is. We'll come back to whether it's random or not momentarily. I love the point that the whole article is based around the fact that two studies are fighting each other. We said this, no, you're wrong, it's actually this. Happens all the time, happens all the time. And we'll talk more about that as the class goes on. Who's, who's the population that we're interested in studying? Is it Americans? No. Is it college age Americans? No. Is it infants under the age of 12? That's not really good, it's children under the age of 12. <laughs> infants under the age of 12. <laughs> infants that used to be my roommates in college. Who are we interested in studying? Coffee. Caffeine addicts, as they call them, regular coffee drinkers or regular users of caffeine. Somewhere here they actually define that. Uh, regular coffee drinkers, and then there was also tea was mentioned somewhere, wasn't it? Next paragraph. Next paragraph. Morning tea, coffee, or other caffeine-containing drinks. So we're interested in people that actually use caffeine on a regular basis and have been classified as caffeine addicts or regular users of caffeine. Now, right there, you've got a problem. In my opinion, you've got a problem because my, what, what, what's the problem? Well, these guys are going through caffeine withdrawal, so of course they're going to have what they're describing, but their average people that are not addicts would actually probably get a jolt. Michael just gave me, there's two definitions you use. You said average people and those who are addicts. How do we define that? <laughs> Did you catch that later on? Uh, hang on. Um, half the group had a something or non-existent intake of caffeine. The other half were medium to high consumers. What's a medium caffeine consumer? I don't know. I'm sure somewhere in the study it was defined. Maybe somebody that has three or more cups a day is medium to high, less than three. I don't know. I'm making this up. I didn't read the study. I don't want to read it because they disagree with each other. I don't care anyway. What I care about is can you guys identify the population? And you did. The population is caffeine addicts or regular caffeine users. Please. Well, we'll I, go ahead. Do we have to know what kind of caffeine or what kind of coffee they're all drinking? It, their implication is that the caffeine addicts are our population. And they themselves have showed us that they, they can't decide on that because it says uh, no jolt from morning coffee. But then down lower it says tea, coffee, or other caffeinated beverages. So I'm thinking the common denominator is caffeine in any, in any way, shape, or form. But the amount hasn't been classified to me. Yeah. And just because I say three cups of coffee, what if you make it strong? Yeah. You're right? Exactly. So there's all kinds of problems with those definitions. In fact, this is what I was getting back to with you. You have to define these things rigorously, or otherwise it's meaningless. I think I mentioned last time there's been a spike in autism rates. Did I have been talking about this in class last time? Yeah. Right? Do you know why there's been a spike in autism rates? Yeah, no because they've redefined other disorders as, auti as autism now. Yeah. It went from 1 in 150 to 1 in 100, because now Asperger's is called autism. It wasn't until about a year ago when it became now an autistic uh, 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 condition. So the rates have gone up by a simple definition change. Does that make sense? So you gotta be careful with that. You gotta read carefully. But only careful with that right now is can you notice the population? Yes, you can. What's the sample? <laughs> yep, who gave up their caffeine? We're gonna assume that they were those caffeine addicts that they were talking about. This goes back to something Hattie mentioned and, and, and Patrick jumped on. He said, wait a minute, you said just like her. Those 379 people ideally are identical to each other. Now, ideally, ish, they're not identical to each other. There's gonna be differences that maybe we're not even looking for. Maybe there's a male-female difference. And I'm, I'm assuming there's an even mix of males and females in that group. Maybe there are, maybe there aren't. But maybe the male and female have a different reaction to caffeine that we don't even understand yet. Who knows, I'm throwing this out there, lurking variables, right? Is that a random sample? I hope, I hope it is, but I, I played in punk bands for years, and a lot of those punk rockers didn't like to work, so a lot of them 